live on YouTube at this moment. And yes, we're live. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining another Musiverso live stream. I'm Pedro from Artist Relations and today I have the amazing Ben Trick with us. And as you can see, he plays the violin. I mean, the very big violin. <laughs> How are you doing, Ben? I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah, let's get the dad jokes out early. <laughs> I can't get it under my chin. It, it, they are stronger than me. They're stronger than me. I can't, I can't resist. So today, guys, as you probably uh, figured, we're going to talk about recording cello and everything that goes with it and how sessions uh, of cello recording go here at Musiverso. Before we start, I just want to give you guys a couple of uh, messages about Musiverso Unlimited. If you are in the waitlist, you should be getting a an invite soon. So if you do want to join Musiverso Unlimited, I highly advise you to do so because spots are filling very very fast and musicians like ben are getting very very uh busy because a lot of people want to record with them they are really good at what they do so i don't blame people for wanting to record with them and if you do want to record some stuff i highly advise to get you know on board as soon as possible and get your sessions going so you can get the most out of your subscription Today we're going to talk about cello. We're going to talk about recording cello and everything that goes with it and how you can take advantage of your cello sessions and how you can make them more effectively, uh, more effective and how you can really, you know, understand how to make the most out of those sessions. If you have any questions while we're talking, please just let us know in the chat. We're more than happy to help you out with any possible questions that you might have if we don't know the answer we're just gonna come up with some no, i'm just kidding we're gonna research <laughs> and we're gonna uh, get back to you with a good answer but after we talk a little bit uh ben actually is going to do a demonstration of what a session uh looks like with a song that if you were in any previous live streams you're probably very familiar with because it was a song that we recorded double bass with Bruno in a past live stream. So from double bass, now we have cello. And I'm wondering if maybe we can get some violence in the future. I don't know. That would be really, really cool. So, Ben, how are you doing tonight? Are you ready to do, make some group? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yeah, Pedro, I think your internet might be a tiny bit patchy. Um, but now all is good here. It's been a super fun day in the Musiversal world. I, I've done, so it's kind of late for me. It's like just after 10 p.m. Uh, so I did 10 sessions, uh, eight sessions today and um, all super varied from like uh, musical theater to singer songwriters to film scores. Um, yeah, just such a wide variety. So yeah, it's all good. And it's been a, it's been a fun day here. That's awesome. Well, eight sessions in a day, so you must be like with your creative juices like flowing and ready for another one, right? <laughs> yeah, to totally. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. It's kind of funny how like you know like it, before I joined, I joined this amazing Universal team, I did a lot of remote work and just never had the opportunity to hang out with people on sessions. And like the power of that for me is is huge, you know, because you just get that feedback you get to you know you just kind of get the conversation you get the kind of the you, build, you know like build relationships over time with these amazing universal clients so uh yeah yeah my batteries are charged man <laughs> that's awesome and actually I, I have a question for you regarding that like you used to do remote work before but you didn't have the interaction with the clients is that what you're saying that's exactly right yeah so you know um it really, you know, I lived in London for many years. I now don't live in London. I live in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I realized that, you know, a lot of my work was remote, but uh, clients would send me material. And, you know, two days later, they'd receive the files. And, um, you know, this process here, just like the, the immediacy, I just think gives, uh, puts us both in such a closer situation to being in a physical studio, you know, Really, what I'm always uh, aiming for is that the computer screen in front of me is, is just the studio glass, you know, and, and that the, the communication is strong. We're able to try ideas out on the fly. We're able to kind of pivot quickly. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, for me, that's like one of the amazing things about Musiversal. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. 
<laughs> that's awesome. And well, you get to live in the middle of nowhere while still doing some sexual work. So that's like, I think that's a dream for at least for me. I also wanted to live in the middle of nowhere, and the, which is like uh, an amazing opportunity to still be able to work with amazing musicians. And I mean, I would never think that that's living in Sao Paulo. I'm, I don't live in the middle of nowhere. I live in a big city in Sao Paulo, Brazil, but. Like, I would never think about, you know, collaborating with a musician in the UK, for example, to uh, in a track that I'm doing for a podcast, which is like, that's crazy. So that's really, really awesome right. about yeah. Musiverso. So you, you've been at Musiverso for a while already, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you've been doing like a lot of sessions. Uh, is there like a common thing that you see uh, in everyday sessions with different clients that you think that it is there anything in common in clients that you you think like well if they just did like this they would get uh so much more out of their sessions like is is there any common mistakes that you're seeing mm -hmm. not necessarily mistakes but uh you know maybe session files or organizing materials kind of stuff like that that would uh make people get more out of the sessions at Museversal? For, for sure yeah 100 100 and and exactly like you say i don't I don't necessarily think of it in any way as a mistake, but um, the big thing for me, um, and I think this is probably universal across all, uh, certainly all uh, session string players, is um, you know I always encourage clients to have the confidence to write dynamics. I think dynamics is, you know, and that's you know, you know, I want this to be soft piano, I want this to be loud forte. And it doesn't necessarily have to be written with the correct conventions, but there's so much information that can be conveyed to me by writing dynamics. And I'd always urge the clients to to at least write some dynamics in. Um, I was thinking about this earlier today, actually, and it occurred to me a really good analogy is like, think of what a drummer would do. You know, like a drummer will play a, a lighter pattern on, on a verse, and as they come to the chorus they'll play a fill or they'll get a bit heavier and they'll move to like a bigger pattern and and I think that conveys really well to you know to what I do so you could almost say you know write a crescendo um, you know in whichever way or just write getting louder a couple of bars before the chorus and that lets me know ah okay I'm aiming for this point and, and, I, th and I think that just ends up with the meaning that the the first take is so much more valuable you know rather than me saying okay i feel like i've i've kind of got my head into the song now or the piece of music or whatever it might be um it, it you know we're really hitting the ground running in such a uh, such a more kind of detailed and musical way so that'd be the big one for me yeah dynamics i think you know because there's so much emotion conveyed in dynamics and and of course the cello has such a huge dynamic range and there's so many kind of uh, tonal uh, varieties that come within that range as well. So, um, you know, we gain so much more expression by writing dynamics. So, uh, yeah, that would be the big one for me. That's really interesting because uh, me as a, a, a well, I'm not a like a professional composer that extensively writes for uh, orchestral instruments or anything like that. In fact, the first times that I uh, had my music recorded properly by a string quartet or by string players was uh, here at Musiverso. Uh, but I've been doing like working with you know VSTs for a while, and I had the impression maybe that writing a lot of details and, and dynamics and instructions in the the score might feel like a little bit of like I'm micromanaging the musician and that might, you know, annoy you. I don't know. Is there like a middle ground to that or should I just put as much details as I want? Like how how can I find that then? Yeah, that's a great that's a great response, Pedro. You're absolutely right. Um because it's always a balancing act, isn't it? Um but I think on the whole, um, yes, you know, if you find that you're writing kind of multiple dynamics every bar or every note, you're saying, mm, I think this, you know, like it's MIDI value 83 in my door. And so I'm going <laughs> to, you know, I want to, you know, then that's too much. But, um, you know, if you're conveying a sense of the overall structure of the piece, uh, you know, like this piece starts with a bang, let me know. Or this piece kind of is really subtle and it builds up. And then at this point, it's like hell for leather. 
be. I, th I think that really puts me in a strong place to like uh, attack. Uh, and when I say attack, I don't mean, you know, uh, in volume or tone, but like let's really nail that performance on the on the first pass. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. That that's really uh, good to hear because I I remember specifically from when I was in college and I was learning how to write music for strings. Uh, we had like this you know orchestration class and the professor was a violin player and she was telling us okay look in when when you're writing a score you can actually write the details for the bowing if you want the. Uh, players to bow something in, like if they want to do like a downstroke or an upstroke or whatever and you can do that but don't ever do that because they're gonna get really annoyed <laughs> doing something like that only if you have like a very 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 specific reason and if you are a great violin player or a cello player or any string player you know exactly what you're doing. Otherwise, it just doesn't make any sense. So have you had any, and this is more out of my uh, personal curiosity, have you had any situations like in your work in the past or here in Miss Verso in which you, you know, the way that you were bowing the instrument were, was actually noted and that was, um, you know, actually useful for the music? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think you've, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head there that um you know bowing is because the way that i see it like, dynamics is kind of like uh step one on the you know once we you know, once the once the, the notes are in place dynamics is kind of like the first step that's kind of large scale structural and then articulation you know i want that note accented or um you know i want uh, i want the piece to be macato or i want this note to be tenuto that's kind of the next step up and and then like bowing that's a couple of further rungs up the ladder i think what you'll generally find and i still find this as a professional cellist whenever i write you know i do a lot of orchestrations and i you know find myself in various studios conducting string orchestras they never pay any attention to any phrasing or bowing that i write that's just that's a, that's a you know and i guess everyone is different physically um uh so yeah, you really need to know what you're doing to write the bowing. Um, by all means, go for it. I personally don't find it off-putting, but don't be offended if I don't play exactly the <laughs> that you've written. But, you know, if you really want, you know, what I get a lot of the time, especially with film scores, is that a break in the bow is is off-putting. And, you know, if you've got a really still passage, which you know, tends to be where you would write for strings a lot, uh, you want this super long note, and you don't want to break in the bow. And so a lot of the time people say, is there any way that we could get that note without a bow change? And, you know, and it's actually kind of amazing just how, uh, you know, how long one bow can last if you're, if you're conservative with it. So, you know, I think that's the exception to the rule. If you just want a, a, a long note with just no breaks at all, absolutely, write, write that slur in, write that phrasing. Um, yeah. That's interesting. So, uh, for the piece that I want that we're gonna record, I would like you know fifty seconds of one bow, if that's uh, possible, please. Uh, but challenge accepted. Now I <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> well, it's um, so moving on from from that part. You know when after the score, when you receive your files from clients, do you actually, what is for you the best way to work? Do you actually like to receive like mock-ups or stuff like that? Or do you prefer to work directly from the score and give your interpretation to the music that you're reading? I think, um, I don't know if this is just a, an English phrase, um, but I think the belts and braces approach is, is always the way to go. You know, send the send. Can you explain that to a Brazilian? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so <laughs> Americans, I think, might say um, belts and suspenders. Uh, you know, you put your belt on, and you also wear your suspenders so that your trousers don't fall down. You're being, you're being, you're being doubly sure. Um, so I think, you know, I think a mock-up is really, really valuable. Um, it's always worth sending. Always send it as a separate file. Don't embed it in the track. Um, and, you know, my aim would be I want to escape the mock-up as quickly as I can, but I'll always listen to it the first first take, often the first couple of takes, 
what I tend to do is I just pan it hard right so it's not in the mix. You know, I can hear it very separately to what I'm doing. I can hear it very separately to the track. And, and of course, the other huge advantage of sending it as a separate file is that, you know, yourself as the client, I can mute it out for you and you don't have to listen to the to the MIDI cello. You can just hear your track and the live cello, whereas I can be referencing uh, the guide. Um, so, yeah, I think it's always worth doing. Um, if you're talking about files, then, um, you know, a big one for me, and, and, I, and I'm sure this is the same for every, you know, every instrumentalist that's done the webinar so far. Uh, if you have a track where there are quite major um, volume differences, you know, like it, say it's, if it's a guitar and voice, if the voice is, let, let's say, arbitrary figure more than like six or nine decibels louder than the guitar, you know, so if you mute your vocal track and the, and the overall level of the track drops by a significant amount, send those separately because what tends to happen is of course on the cello i'm going to try and lock in as much with the guitar as with the voice or you know or whatever it might be uh if the vo if the vocal is really loud it sometimes can be really difficult to either intonate to the guitar part or just to you know to kind of get a groove you know to time with it so that that's that's one that i notice quite often um and i think again that can it's just all about making these sessions as uh, as productive as they can be, and yeah, so that's that's another big one with um, with file upload. Yeah, that's awesome, and it's great to hear because actually uh, a lot of musicians they have different preferences as to what kind of files they like to receive and what like, what kind of mixes they like to receive uh, to record to, uh, and of course it also depends a lot on the. I imagine it also depends a lot on the kind of music that. Uh, the, the track is like if it's a, a a soundtrack or a song that goes on the radio is going to be very very different um we've had musicians uh mention that they don't like to receive like a lot of stems they just like one maybe one track and there's a, if they're recording uh bass for example bruno mentioned that like they want the bruno mentioned he likes to receive like the whole track uh and without a bass and one bass track if you have a mock-up which he can mute if he wants to. And then that's how he works. Um, maybe like have the drums separate if the drums are very, very important and the rhythm is, it, the groove is very important and he wants to lock into that. So when it comes to you, what are you listening to? You mentioned the guitar and I think this is really interesting. What are you listening to when you're recording and what is important to you and what do you sort of kind of ignore and would prefer to be a little bit lower in the mix? Yeah, that's, oh, that's, boy, that's a difficult question, actually, because, um, <laughs> you know, I think, um, you know, everyone's different, right? But for me personally, I, I tend to approach everything that I do with an arranger's mind. Um, so I want to know where the cello fits in, into the hole. Um, so I don't tend to ever monitor with, like, just one thing really loud. I tend to want to, you know, listen to the mix. And that will really inform me where, you know, where I slot into that. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Bruno mentioned the drum solo. That's not necessarily a thing for me. I think that's maybe just a difference between a bass player and a, and a cellist. The, 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 the thing that did occur to me is someone might find themselves in a situation where they think, I don't really feel comfortable sending my vocal soloed up. Um, and that's, I, I think that's completely legitimate. And I've thought a few times, you know, a really good rule of thumb would be send a song complete s without the cello parts. Send a guide cello if, if you so wish, no obligation to do that. And then and, and then send a version without, if you feel like the vocals sit pretty proud of the rest of the song, sit pretty loud, just send, just send a version without vocals, you know. And then between those three, I've got all the balance options that I need. You know, if I need to just lock in with the band, and the full mix, there's just a lot of vocals and it just, you know, which is great. You know, I love mixes. But they're really vocal, kind of vocal proud. Um, but yeah, between those three options, that really just gives me everything that everything that I need. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and now to the soundtrack side, uh, when when we're talking about music that is more orchestral and have uh, they're not necessarily songs that play on the radio. 
um mm. if you were record i imagine if like the cello is a very important part of the like a solo cello or something uh i imagine of course the rest is going to be very, pretty low but if you are recording let's say a cello that is going to be used to be stacked uh with vsts so we can add up to that and make that those vsts sound more realistic mm -hmm. is there a particular kind of mix that you prefer that helps you to uh build that kind of sound yeah you know i tend to um very rarely have uh balance issues when it comes to like a uh a, a full VST, fully orchestral mix. I think the nature of working with those kind of VSTs, they tend to balance themselves out uh, pretty pretty well. Um, yeah, so that, that doesn't tend to be that much of an issue. Um, and even, you know, when someone's halfway through the process, they've, you know, recorded all of the winds, let's say, but the strings are still VSTs. It, it very it very rarely tends to be problematic it's it, it tends to be more the kind of the um you know songs where level discrepancies can kind of stand in the way yeah sounds great and uh now speaking of you know stacking uh tracks for vsts Usually, yeah. one thing that we producers like to do is like record a lot of take, different takes, maybe move the microphones a little bit, use different microphones. Have you ever done that for Museverse? We do that. What kind of mic positions can we try out? That's a that's a huge thing for me, Pedro. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about like, let's say your kind of classic Abbey Road Studio 2 string, string section, there might be you know, six cellos and Probably the principal cellist will be spot mic'd or maybe the front desk. So it'll be, you know, probably like a FET 47 or something between the two cellos. But the rest of the cellos are just being mic'd purely ambiently. And if you want to try to recreate that sound, um, which I think I spend a lot of time doing. I've got a lot of expertise in, in, in layering cellos. Really, the key to that is to get off of a kind of central axis. So what I tend to do, I don't know if it's in picture here, there's another cello hanging on the wall over there. I've got a couple of bows. And if someone comes to me and they say, I, I, I just want you to make a cello section, I'll say, absolutely, let's do the, the principal part right here. And how it tends to go, the principal cellist, we might do you know two or three passes just to get that kind of master take really in. You know, we might even build like a, a little working comp, just take the best bits, you know, it's not going to be like fancy crossfades, but enough to work from. And then I'll move, I'll swap cellos, I'll swap bows, I'll move around the room. So, you know, maybe this is kind of position one, and then maybe, you know, I'll, I'll be on a different cello and this will be position two. So it's not a huge shift. And then, you know, maybe over here, position three. Uh, it just makes such a huge difference. Any, any tonal variety, that you can bring into the recording just it just adds up significantly or when you think of it in the opposite direction if you're recording the same cello into the same mic in the same position it's it's not going to be long before you you you're encountering quite quite serious phase issues um and and so that so this is a great way to avoid that i actually have um five microphones set up for musiversal sessions so everything I record gets recorded with three microphones. Um, so there's a, again, I'm not quite sure um, if they're in shot right now, but there's a, there's a tube mic. There's a, um, there's a lovely uh, 1970s small diaphragm condenser and there's a ribbon. Uh, they're all pretty phase aligned. Uh, so when you listen into a session, you're hearing all three mics slightly panned. So you get like a lovely wide sound. Um, but of course, with that, you get a lot of tonal variety already. You know, like the tube mic is your kind of classic authoritative cello sound, really good low end. The, the pencil tends to be a bit more analytical. Uh, and, and of course, the ribbon, you can do so much with the ribbon, but off the bat, it just tends to be a bit more kind of vintage sounding, a bit warmer, a bit less kind of, a bit less high end. But then there's also, I've got two room mics um about about 10 feet away and so when i'm you know if say if we're tracking six cellos to make a section 
then I'll I'll swap the mics out so that we're recording the room mics. So like and once I'm you know once I'm kind of back here, we've probably got you know 12 feet, so we're getting a lot of air in the sound. And with with those back desk back desk takes, um, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, so um, I think that can be that can, that can just speed up the the mixing process so much. You know, rather than kind of ending up chopping all these frequencies that are just repeating on one another. Uh, that's a bit of a rant, but I, I see, I see both no, sides of um, you know how how much of a big difference it can make. <laughs> but that's awesome because I imagine, like, I, I'm thinking of myself. This is this is one thing that I um, uh, would really look for uh, when I'm recording cellos because uh, or any stringed instruments because it's it's so hard to make them sound good in with a VST depending on your writing and I, the way I write music particularly it doesn't sound good in VSTs uh, it you have to work really really hard to make the VSTs sound half decent so right. being able to do that it's awesome and I imagine of course for these kinds of sessions having the material like very very specific very spot on so you can just get in and play uh, because since you're going to be moving around a lot and changing microphones, changing cellos, having a very, having very specific material and very clear instructions on what I'm expecting is probably the way to go to make sure that the session is as productive as possible. Am I right? Uh, well, yeah, yes, yes, and no. You know, um, mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, that's always, you know, that's always a great starting point. But again. Um, I don't think anyone should be uh, should be put off uh, or worried or scared of writing for any orchestral instrument. Really, that's one of the really amazing things about a musical session that you can you know that you can write. We can try ideas out, and because the communication is it, it is so good that we can pivot quickly and we can we can you know we can find that ideal part. You know, like, like one thing that happens quite often is um, it's very hard to ascertain actually what the range is when you listen to VSTs. You hear it on a, on a real instrument and immediately say, that's the right range or that's not the right range. I get a lot of parts that are written an octave too high and people come and say, it, it kind of sounds too high. Can you play it an octave lower? And I'll say, yeah, sure. Or, or no, it, you know, the, the range isn't there on the instrument. Um, so you know we're, we're able to experiment so yeah sure like perfect parts are always really appreciated but you know we can always you know we can all, always always make it worse that's actually a great uh way to start off uh, one of my last questions before we move on to the actual recording uh and if for, for uh, we have a couple of people watching us right now if you have any questions please let us know here in the chat uh, you have Ben here, which is an expert on cello, ready to answer any questions that you might have about cello. Uh, and if I were you, I would totally take advantage of it. Well, I am taking advantage of that and asking everything that I want to ask. <laughs> so you should do the same. And well, what, while you, you were speaking about that, you know, uh, experimentation and that, uh, that's really uh, something that, it's interesting to me because sometimes when I'm writing, I don't really know what the cello can do in a couple of tracks uh, because, well, I'm not a cellist. Uh, the only thing that I know about cello is that it sounds amazing and it fixes a lot of problems when I don't know how to make something sound good. Just throw a cello in it and it's going to sound great because the cello <laughs> is an amazing instrument. Uh, it's, it's sort of like a cheat code for me. But if I'm not sure what the cello can do or what I actually want the cello to do, if I want to experiment a couple of things, uh, how comfortable are you improvising uh, in or you know thinking with in some ideas with me? And what kind of material or references are you looking for that I send you before the session so we can have a productive? Maybe we're gonna end that session and I'm not gonna have any actual files that I'm going to throw in the DAW and actually use, but at least I'm going to have some ideas in my head, which was what I'm, I was looking for. So what mm. are you comfortable doing that? How do you work with that, those kinds of sessions? Oh yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I love to improvise. Uh, I spend a lot of time improvising, um, in kind of other, other worlds outside of, uh, Musiversal. I play quite a few different instruments. Um, 
and and the 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 reason that I mention that is that um, I think I have kind of quite a broad uh, view of music. You know, like I. I think it really, I think, I mean, I think it's such a valuable thing for any instrumentalist to learn to play another instrument because the more kind of perspectives that you have, the, the better, the, the better you you know, better place you're in. Um, so that definitely influences my, uh, m you know, my kind of improvisation skills. Um, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of material, just like a good chord chart, um, really, that's, that's all that's required. Um, a lot of the time people will send uh, a chord chart and and a written part and they'll say this is kind of what i had in mind but just do your thing you know and um like i had a session today for like an awesome producer songwriter and it was like a, a amazing funk track and he said this is kind of he'd basically written in like here's all the chord changes with the correct timing and then just kind of you know do your thing so like that's a really great place to put it you know roughly want the cello to fill this territory write a skeletal parts give me a chord chart and, and we're good to go really um yeah yeah you know there's um there's one other thing that just popped into my head so let me just mention it before i forget it that the other thing uh that tends to happen that slows down the progress in the session is that people will send a full score um and I can understand the virtue of sending a full score. People say, I'm sure you want to reference the other parts. In reality, um, the the way that I, and I think most instrumentalists will reference other parts is audibly, just by listening and kind of responding. Um, and if you send a score, ultimately what that means is that the whole piece isn't going to be able to fit on a page or a screen. And rather than being able to play from the top of the piece down to the bottom, I'm probably going to have to stop a few times and scroll. You know, if it's a score that's over seven pages versus, versus a cello part that's over two pages, um, it's always, always worth just sending a, a separate part. Even if it's like three cello parts, send separate cello parts. And it just means that we progress through the session so much more rapidly. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's just kind of screen management. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally imagine that. Um, I, I remember when I used to I used to sing in a choir before, and I, I was a bass, and I absolutely hated nice. those scores. Like when we had to play a song, sing a song, that we only had the score, like the full score. We didn't have the parts separated because it it means that I have to be turning the pages while I'm singing, and I always got confused. And the thing that would always happen is I would just give up and start looking at my neighbor's uh, scores because I oh. I would just <laughs> mess up and end up in a different page. Well, so... at least the singer has a has a hand to turn the page. Oh yeah, <laughs> when you're definitely. playing the cello, like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find like a bar's rest and quickly like scroll down. But, uh, anyway, send, send separate parts so always always appreciated. <laughs> awesome. Uh, by the way, I I probably am putting myself on the spot here, and that's cool. But I sent you a I sent you a score for today's uh, recording, mm. and I didn't know exactly what to do because I wanted to experiment two lines uh, for the track, which is like a very very short six uh, bar piece that is like a podcast opening and i had like two ideas in mind and i just wrote them down quite like fast in uh, whatever software and i didn't i, I kind of signaled them as a and b uh how clear was that for you like did i mess up doing that how can i would you rather me to send like two files how uh do you prefer for me to send that kind of stuff what you sent was uh was super clear pedro yeah it was awesome yeah okay. uh you've labeled at the uh at the end of the a section there's you know there's kind of a a final bar line to signify you know this is this section is done with and uh yeah so it was super clear i think really you know a good rule of thumb is uh by all means send um a score or multiple parts on one page if it fits onto I think really a, good, a great rule of thumb is if you can read it clearly without having to scroll on your phone, you know, so if you pull up the PDF and the whole thing fits on your phone and you can read it clearly, then I can read it great. Um, so what you sent there is just on one page, like awesome, super clear to read and like beautifully notated, so four marks. 
<laughs> okay, awesome. That's that's great. And after the live stream is over, if there is anything that I can do better, you can tell me so that you, uh, people don't know. Well, so just just so people know what we're talking about, uh, this is the the material that I sent uh, to Ben, and we have like this first part which is one line that i wanted to experiment and i signal here with uh this end bar line thing that i wanted to like it was essentially over and then the b part here and this would be like the other six uh bars that i wanted to try this is by all means that is not correct like classically speaking if i sent this to college when while i was in college my professor would just tear my head off because this is totally not the way to go but, like, well, Ben understood the message, which which is what matters to me. So, shall we go to the recording por por portion of this uh, live stream? Absolutely. Yeah, sounds good. So let me share awesome. my Pro Tools screen with you. So, for everybody that is listening, if you watched the last podcast, uh, the last podcast, the last live stream with uh, Bruno Migliari, the double bass player, we actually recorded the double bass part for this opening. This is a podcast opening. A this is like an audio drama podcast about the de like death, like the angel death, the the mythologic creature death with you know the Grim Reaper or so or sorts. So it's kind of you know weird, grimy, something like that. And we're looking for that kind of sound. Uh, Bruno recorded the bass and Ben, there's these two lines that I would like to try. If you have any ideas that come up to your mind, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, you're the expert here, so. Sure thing, yeah. So why don't I do two passes? I, I know that I'm gonna mute out uh... A uh, little software in the background so that it doesn't echo. Awesome. So I'll do two passes and, and then I'll come back to you. Sounds great. So uh, just before Ben starts, I would just want to let you guys know if you want to listen to Ben actually recording this, you can access audio movers and listen to the direct screen coming from Bren, from Ben. Uh, I'm gonna put the link and the password in the chat here uh, on YouTube, and you get to listen to the best quality, which is the same quality that you would listen to at a Musiversal session. Ben, you can mute me and the stage is yours. Nice. Subtle change there. Hopefully, no one noticed that.
I muted so you weren't listening to me. But that's sounding great. And um, there's just one thing that now I want to put you on the spot. Uh, because you said you liked improvising. It it sounds great. This was exactly what I was looking for when I wrote that, and I'm definitely going to uh, try some stuff out. But you mentioned that you like to improvise and you like to think of new ideas and whatnot. So this is a very simple pizzicato that I wrote, but you can hear, like, in the background, there is, like, some sound effects and weird, like, grimy death cemetery kind of sounds going on. Mm. Uh what kind of sounds can you like weird sounds can you make with a cello are there any weird sounds that you can make with a cello yeah I mean, there's a lot of weird sounds that you can make with the cello um so let's start uh with the kind of less weird stuff um you know a really good starting point is uh tremolo um and actually it's worth mentioning with tremolo because of course tremolo exists uh on the cello it also exists as a guitar pedal so tremolo i get a lot of people saying can you play tremolo and actually what they're asking for is a change of volume like a tremolo pedal but tremolo on the cello is <laughs> Another great technique. Um, so as you move the bow towards the bridge, it becomes more scratchy, um, more harmonic. Um, um, so that might be a good technique. That's called sol ponticello. It means on the bridge, I think. Um, I so really like the Sol Ponticello thing. Sol Ponticello, yeah. You could even I combine really like the two that. and do a Sol Ponticello tremolo. That Should sounds awesome. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm hoping they're the right notes. I don't have the chords in front of me. How's that working? I really love that. It it does sound more much more green reapery. The I absolutely love that sound. So just to let you know, while you were uh, recording uh, now and before, we actually had a couple of comments uh, from people that uh -huh. had sessions with you in the past. Uh -huh. uh, we just had a comment from uh, Tony Solato. Uh, he said he had a great session with you, but he had to put the cello in the back because it was sounding so good. It was taking uh, the attention out of the vocals. So Interesting. You, yeah. You can be too good, apparently. Hi, hi Tony. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. You know, um, that's I think that's a really that's a really important thing for all of us um, that, you know, <sighs> music uh there's there's an idea that music is a very kind of ego driven industry and actually i think the the skill of kind of being invisible um you know the kind of classic thing of like i didn't realize it was there until i muted it um <laughs> that's always such a good thing to strive for especially with a song um so yeah um cheers tony that's a great that's a great comment and you know i'd say never feel um like you're going to offend any, I think any of us really by saying, you know, it's great, but 
it just needs to be background it needs to be less soloistic or um you know just it needs to be um under the vocal sotto voce <laughs> there we go uh, i just love what comment uh, uh, a thing that you said that i think it's an expression that i i kind of say all the time but i've never heard in those words which is i never noticed it was there until i muted it and i think this is so awesome because it's so it's a, such a cool concept of music because we often especially when we're in the music production side of things we think like oh yeah not no no one is even going to notice that but like is the it it is the details that count and make music like something amazing maybe we don't notice it but we feel it so i oh, absolutely 100%. i just wanted to say that i love that comment yeah man absolutely i you know my other big passion in life is cooking and i and i think a lot of a lot of the time if i'm writing or playing i think kind of in terms of flavors and i don't know if everyone's familiar with that term umami it's like kind of like deep thickening kind of savory flavor you know you find it in a lot of asian food or you know even like barbecue um i think like i love being like the kind of umami ingredients the kind of thickening agents uh the kind of savory saltiness within the track you know it's not like it's never going to be at the front but I th yeah I, i'm with you i think that that has so much value and it can be the difference between playing a track and going holy smokes it sounds amazing and being like oh it sounds really nice you know uh, yeah it's a big one that's yeah that's awesome and and i love that like we when we have musicians that have this uh background and this experience this helps uh, helps a lot especially us in the music production side or even in the songwriting side to get to that because there's like this is certainly something that i there are certainly a couple of things that I wouldn't think about when I am producing that a musician would. Like, I, uh, no one's going to give, uh, s you know, that much importance to a cello track as the cello player. Like, is it is the most important track in the in the song for you because you are doing that. So you're going to pay attention to those details and you're going to essentially, you know, help us to achieve this, which is, uh, right. I, I think, it's just awesome. Uh, we also had a, a comment from Louise McCorkingdale. I hope I am pronouncing that right. I apologize for, for my uh, English slash Portuguese uh, going on here. She just said that Ben is amazing. She Ben is amazing. She uh, trusts your skills and instincts and just throws a chord chart at him, and he improvises beautiful cello parts. Oh, so, thanks, Louise. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, two two awesome clients. So thank you both for your for your comments. Yeah. <laughs> and well you're just proving yourself like this sounds like this i absolutely love the way that it's sounding right now uh but we do have a little bit more time in this live stream if no one has a question guys if you do have questions please ask uh we're here to uh answer but ben i would like to hear from you like we heard a couple of techniques going on there we heard pizzicato and so ponticello with tremolo mm -hmm. um not necessarily something that would fit on this track, but are there any other techniques that you find uh, interesting that people often don't even know about uh, when it comes to cello? Because honestly, when I think about cello, I just think of, you know, a beautiful Bach melody, mm. uh, which is the, the thing that everyone thinks about uh, when it comes to cello, I believe. Uh, what kind of sounds yeah. can we make with a cello? Oh, goodness. I mean, you know, it kind of like you can... Not to put people off but you know you can really go like you know you can go kind of quite out there with a the cello like for me that's like the sound of a creaking ship or something you know it's like what an awesome sound uh obviously you don't need to go that crazy i think harmonics if we're kind of going down the kind of uh sinister or dark or kind of spooky character i think harmonics can be amazing a lot of people don't realize that harmonics can be very melodic um so like um let's play in the same key it almost takes on the quality of um like a musical saw you know like a bowed saw um there are, yeah, there's so many there's so many others you know i think with sample libraries these days, I th you know, a lot of people turn up very well versed with articulations. 
spiccato is, or you know, or staccato is something that I'm asked for a lot. <laughs> goodness and, and 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 you know there's there's such kind of tonal variation from the most kind of let me let me move back into from the kind of wispiest all the way up to You know, to like really espressivo and passioned, um, and obviously there's such a kind of range in between those two as well. Um, That's yeah. absolutely awesome. Like, <laughs> it's it's great how versatile this uh, uh, instrument can be. But now I'm very curious. Can you you showed like the harmonics uh, playing that that melody sort of like uh, the same melody that you played with the tremolo and the the um, in my track can we try that harmonic thing because i think it sounded awesome yeah me too yeah i was hoping that you might say that <laughs> let me just take uh, awesome. let me just take a listen to remind myself yeah yeah Yeah, if you have like any other uh, ideas that you would like, you don't want to play exactly that, feel free. I trust you. Man, that sounds awesome. Yeah. How hard is it to, for you to play harmonics and staccato? Oh. Is it possible, like just, just out of curiosity, is it possible to record that second part with uh, staccato harmonics? That sounds really cool, man. <laughs> we can't like if if you don't record this now, I'm actually going to re like schedule a session with you that we so we can record that because it sounds really really f that's awesome. I love it.
Man, that sounds freaking great. I almost cursed uh, on a live stream because it sounds really awesome. Uh, and it's actually great that it's in the realm of Melodyne because it, if it's a little bit out of tune, I think it works perfectly with the track. So that's really, really great, man. Thank you so much. Um, we actually have a question from Michelle James now, uh, which was uh, it's considering a little bit of the the talk that we were having uh, before about improvising and uh, you know coming up with a part in a session. Uh, she asked if you are okay with writing something or coming up with them with something just by hearing voice and piano, or would you like like a chart or something like that? That's uh, absolutely right. And I'm, I'm really happy that you touched on the writing part because this is something really important about Museversal. Museversal uh, doesn't provide any writing uh, services uh, as of yet. In fact, we have singer, you know, we have songwriting. Um, yeah, uh, I forgot the word in English then, but uh, we have sing sing songwriting advice sessions but uh, we don't have songwriting sessions uh, because we'd rather, uh, of course, you know, teach you how to fish rather than just give you uh, the fish. And also because when it comes to writing, it also involves royalties, involves, uh, you know, ownership, copyrights, that kind of stuff. And essentially every single session in Musiverso is 100% buyout. So the musician uh, is paid for that session and you keep 100% of the copyrights the rights, the the royalties. Uh, you you don't owe and own uh, any royalties for anyone. But uh, when the musician gets to write something, that it then it's a little bit different than just uh, playing uh, on a track or improvising uh, on a track. So, right. and also Ben, you mentioned something that is uh, I, I I mentioned before and is crucially important as well. Like when you don't know exactly what you're looking for and you you don't have a written part uh, for. Uh, a very specific uh, and detailed written part for what you're looking for, for your track, maybe that first session isn't going to uh, give you any usable files, uh, final files that you're actually going to put in that song and, uh, you know, use that as a cello part. 
maybe it's just going to give you the idea and give you the um the actual counter melody that you were looking for or the actual mm. part that you were looking for and then you can schedule a session to actually properly record that which you used the previous session to come up with uh and it's really important to have that you know set those expectations and get into into uh that session knowing that maybe you won't come out of those sessions with the actual files that you need but you will come out of the session of that session with the idea that you were looking for. And of course, if you go into the session with the idea, with a very clear idea and very specifically written down and uh, very well detailed, then of course you're gonna get out of that session with the files that you're actually gonna, going to use in the track, you know, the final files in a good uh, take. I think that's a yeah, point really well, well raised, Pedro. Absolutely, you know, um, I think there's so much value uh, obviously, the sessions are, are short, um, and there's so much value in even even being able to kind of build a palette. You know, what does this sound like? What what does it sound like down the octave, or really loud, or really quiet, or you know, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, there's there's a huge amount of value to that, and that can then provide the inspiration to go forward and say, yeah, okay, I really know what I want now. Um, yeah. Exactly, and uh, this is something that I actually mentioned in a in a last uh, in another live stream, if I'm not mistaken. But like when I started, you know, producing music, I felt like every single student studio session had to be a very productive session. Like I had to get out of the studio with actual tracks that were very well written, very well performed, and very well recorded. Uh, and that simply is not the case. Like when you when you start to produce a lot and get into the studio a lot, you know that sometimes it just doesn't happen. Like especially when you need a creative uh, insight to what you were looking for, sometimes it it's just not there. And it's is like a hit or miss kind of thing. And it's kind of experimenting. Like you probably you don't have what you need, but you tried fifteen things that you know that don't work. So you have fifteen le fifteen things that you know that you don't have to try anymore because you know that they, they don't work and you can move on to the other 115 things that you 100 uh, yeah the, re the reason that i'm smiling is that i've been uh, certainly in the early days of uh you know my my kind of work as an arranger when i was still kind of sharpening my tools and i'd find myself on a you know a three-hour session with with you know a, a string section and we play down the first take and immediately i say ah, this isn't right i need to i need to make some changes and I'd literally be there in the control room, listening to playback, like scribbling in changes and then like, oh, back into the live room. Okay, guys, in bar 42, second violins, it's not a B flat anymore, you know. And, and actually, it's really nice if you think about it of, uh, you know, taking a small component of that three hour session, check, you know, checking out what works, what doesn't, and then being able to step away, have a bit of time to make the amendments and come back. There's so much, if I could, if I could do that on a, have your own session i'd be so happy you know it's like there's it's great to have that flexibility <laughs> i think we oh you're back i think you're back right oh uh, yeah i i i'm still here <laughs> awesome i i don't know if i froze or if you froze but people in the live stream will be able to tell me that but uh yeah. i i i was listening a little parts of you talking about you uh, being in the, the control room and scribbling things down and going back and re-recording that. But yeah, that's uh, you're 100% right. There is something magic that happens. Uh, and uh, it's very important to, to have, you know, be aware, be wary of those expectations and uh, knowing that music works uh, in that way sometimes. And, and if we have very specific, very realistic expect expectation sets set uh then we we don't run into problems when it comes to you know not meeting those expectations so uh right. guys if you have any questions this is the final uh your final opportunity to ask them uh we are actually over our time so i'm gonna give you one last chance to uh ask ben whatever you need to ask and uh, we have like about 20 seconds buffer ben between the actual live stream and what uh and talking uh right now so i'm just sure gonna thing. give a couple of last uh you know final messages before we move on to any final questions that might show up so guys oh, yeah, thank great. you uh so if you're listening, still listening to this, thank you so much. Uh, it's very good to have you here. If you're not part of Musiverse Unlimited yet, 
you should uh, get into the waitlist if you're not part of the waitlist. And if you are part of the waitlist soon, you will be getting an invite to join. And as I told you, uh, a lot of our musicians are very busy. So you should get in as soon as possible so you could score those sessions and record what you're looking for. And well, Ben just showed you why our musicians are pretty busy because they just come up with great ideas for your songs and they make your song much better than it was before. So you should definitely give it a try and get you know take advantage of this because this is definitely going to take your music to the next level and ben thank you so much for this masterclass today and also for just making this amazing recordings for my track i'm going to look so good when i show this to my client <laughs> it's a pleasure pedro yeah thanks this this was a lot of fun i really enjoyed it Awesome. It was a pleasure to have you here. And I don't think we have any last questions. Do you have any final thoughts or things that you would like to share with everyone before we go? I mean, yeah, I, I always I always have final thoughts. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, perhaps this is something for, 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 a, for a separate webinar. But, um, you know, at some point it'd be great to cover. Um, you probably see a big pedal board behind me. And, I, you know, I... I do a lot of sound effects stuff and, um, you know, much more kind of um, experimental for want of a better word um, that can, you know, often just be just the right, you know, if you imagine a sound that's kind of somewhere between a cello and a synthesizer, it's organic, but it has a kind of, uh, you know, a luscious to it and a kind of otherworldliness to it as well. Um, that's a, that's another great thing to, to explore. And that's, you know, that's just another palette within the kind of, cello sessions um yeah we we have so many like impeccably talented clients we're so lucky to have you know massive award-winning composers and you know people that have like just achieved the, the highest heights within the mu music industry it's incredible but I, but i would say you know for anyone that is either starting out or doesn't feel like they have like oh my goodness writing for cello is 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 kind of scary just like just just go for it um yeah it's um you know we we're always able to um you know to kind of work together and, and find that find that part so um yeah just have the confidence to go for it but i say that for knowing that we have so many insanely talented clients <laughs> That's awesome, Ben. Thank you so much. And yes, I would absolutely love if we could do like a live stream uh, covering this uh, the whole sort of effects and other things that we can do. With it. That would be absolutely amazing. And uh, thank you also for your, this final words. Like they're very encouraging, especially for us starting out writing for uh, instruments that could be a little bit intimidating at first when you look at them, especially when you are used to looking at them, you know, in a orchestra setting with uh you know people wearing suits and recording them and and playing them um i don't even own a suit so I'm, i was like can i but <laughs> it, it was really really awesome thank you so much and thank you everyone that joined us today uh, we are going to be back this thursday with a live stream about sound editing and audio editing with Arthur Romeo, another member of our roster. If you have any ideas or topics that you would like us to cover in any other live streams, any future live streams, please let us know. Join our Circle community and hit send us a message there. We're always very happy to receive uh, you know, suggestions and feedback. If there's anything we can do to make this better, please let us know. And thank you so much, everyone, and good night.